Praise the Lord, saints. We are continuing our series entitled Impactful Ambassadors of Christ, and it's based upon 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. Uh, last, actually, two weeks ago, we started talking about one of the most impactful ambassadors that we see uh, throughout the Bible, who was Daniel. And we saw some of the ways in which, uh, even though life circumstances may have taken him in an untoward toward, um, um, situation, being pretty much held hostage and taken into captivity to be uh, groomed to be under the very person who ruined his life, that God still used him mightily. Amen. And it just shows you that even though we might go into situations that are unexpected or even traumatic, uh, one of the main points we looked at was the fact that being forced into unexpected, traumatic, or hostile situations doesn't negate God's calling upon your life. And then last week was Father's Day as well as Juneteenth. So I talked about how in this, the same way I mentioned uh, women can use the nurturing and mothering aspects of uh, their traits and attributes to be mothers to those who need that spiritually, and they can use that as ambassadors of Christ. Last week, I talked about how we, um, in the likeness of God and Jesus, amen, can be fathers to the fatherless. And that's been something that Pam and I have actually been praying about for years. And here's the thing. If you truly pray about something and your heart is in it, God will often give you the very thing that you're talking about. Last week, I really emphasized being a father to the fatherless. And literally, Monday and Tuesday... I was able to meet two 15-year-old men, young men, who both, uh, one is lives with his mother, but is brought back and forth with his grandmother. The other one lives with his grandmother, and he suffered two losses, one of his mother and his grandmother, grandma, one of his grandmothers on the other side in short time, but they immediately um, just open up to me, amen? So, um, and then afterwards, people that were observing and had talked to him later said, man, they just click with you and they just love interacting with you. So it just shows you if you have a heart to be a mother to the motherless, a father to the fatherless, that God could use your natural um, traits to enable you to be a blessing in the lives of other people. So we're going to continue on uh, looking at various attributes and one of the things that we saw with Daniel is that he was also an interpreter of dreams. So it shows us that we not only have innate um, natural characteristics that are embedded in us, but also as these things come in, in tandem with our spiritual gifts, we can use those to be ambassadors and to have an impact upon people, to let them see that the God we serve has you know, empowered us to be effective and impactful in the lives of other people, even people who are leaders above us. God can use us despite the roles, the socioeconomic background, and any other criteria that is in play. God can still use us via our natural as well as our spiritual gifts. So as I'm talking about uh, being an interpreter of dreams, um, in addition to his great wisdom that you see in the book of Daniel from cover to cover, uh, as I said, Daniel was a master interpreter of dreams. They had multiple people who were dream interpreters, but then there was times where they were totally stumped and they were like, I, I don't know. I just have no revelation of what this means. And, you know, one time Daniel actually and heroically averted a royal decree that was issued in 421 B.C., to slay all the wise men uh, of the kingdom because of their failure to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's um, mysterious dreams that he had seen. Amen. But then in comes Daniel. Um, and Daniel was not a lone ranger. He came in alignment with his friends and they prayed 
and they entreated God to say, hey, God, you know, give us wisdom to avert, you know, this uh, disaster that's about to unfold with him being angry and wanting to kill all the wise men, which could include us. And because they sought God as opposed to their natural abilities, God gave a revelation and revealed what the dream meant. So the request was granted. And after expressing gratitude to God, Daniel came in, interpreted the dream. You know, the response was, wow, you're, you're, you're great, you're wonderful. Look, you were able to do it. All the other people could not do. And Daniel did not attribute his gifting, whether it was natural or spiritual, to himself. But he attributed those things to God himself. He said, it's the almighty God who gave me the wisdom and the revelation you seek. It is not born of me. I attribute everything associated with, associated with my life and all the things that I offer you, I attribute the, those things to God. So he gave glory to God in the midst of the amazing thing that he had done. So he proceeded to remind King Nebuchadnezzar of his dream, amen, and he provided him with a striking prediction regarding his future describing the fact that there were going to be successive kingdoms that would rise to power and dominate the civilized world. And these empires included the Median Persian, the Greek, as well as the Roman Empire. These are things that Daniel foresaw. And despite the fact that he provided this revelation, once again, he still remained humbled at all times. He refused all efforts. Here's the thing. People wanted to deify him. They said, you must be a god to have these types of you know, revelations and wisdoms. So they tried to deify him. They tried to bow down and prostrate themselves before him as if he was a god. And he denied every offer to receive special accolades for anybody to try to worship him. He was like, I refuse to accept anything in which you would glorify me as if I were a God. I'm just a normal man who is gifted by God. Amen? So, but God permitted him to be promoted to the governor over the entire province of Babylon, as well as a prime minister over all the wise men. And the thing is, we'd already seen this through one of his predecessors, Joseph, who gave all glory to God and rose up to be a governor, even though he similar, similarly went through some harsh circumstances. So we might go through some horrible things, but yet God can still rise us up, not only to be somebody who is a leader, somebody that people can seek knowledge from, but you can literally be in the enemy's camp or kingdom, and God can raise you up to a pivotal position to give insight to the very enemy, even, that had come in to oppress you, to kidnap you, who may have, been, even in his case, probably killed most of his family. Yet God still rose them up, amen, to be somebody who could be prominent. So Daniel was able to do that, and he continued to have uh, dreams and visions, including notifying Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sure he didn't like this one, <laughs> that he would be struck with insanity for seven years and reduced to the level of an animal to make him recognize the authority and power of God before he enabled him to be restored. Matter of fact, there's times where you'll see these type of folk tales and legends of these mythical creatures. If you look at the description of Nebuchadnezzar, a man who was insane, a man whose hair grew all over his body and had sharp fingernails, like, sounds like a werewolf. <laughs> I read this one book and it said that, you know, all these things that you attribute in the books to vampires, that's what happens to a person who is stricken and does not have a cure for rabies. Before they, they die, they can't look at themselves in mirrors, they, they, they avert, are averse to water, they're insane, they attack people, they try to bite. <laughs> some of these things have some real situations and natural reasons for these folk tales and legends. So Nebuchadnezzar, in a sense, was the world's first werewolf, <laughs> at least recorded. <laughs> but what does this show us in terms of the Word of God? Let's go to 1 Peter 5, 
six through seven. Um, I know that was a a little lengthier in terms of the intro, but this is pretty much, uh, I guess you would say, our text scripture for today. First Peter chapter five, verses six through seven, and it says, "Humble yourselves, therefore." Under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So we've seen the humility of Daniel. And then we saw how he was elevated in the sight of not only the wise men and his peers, but even under the kingly leadership of Nebuchadnezzar himself. He humbled himself. Under the mighty hand of God. He didn't try to seek self-glorification because of that. And the fact that he remained humble and he lowered himself before God. God exalted him in due time. Amen. The due time was, I'm about to kill all the wise men. Daniel's back. Hey, I'm just serving. Not making any, you know, major statements to bring attention to myself. I'm just, hey, one of the different... Wise men, me and my buddies here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Betty, at Bednego. But in due time, when the time was urgent and needed, when the season of deliverance came into play, God elevated them up, and especially Daniel up, because he had humbled himself. Amen. So the mighty hand of God exalted him during a time of great pressure and trepidation. Let's open up with a word of prayer before we, before we continue on. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything that you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the insight, for the victories, for blessing us to be ambassadors of Christ, that if we humble ourselves, just as we saw Daniel humble himself, in due time, you will elevate us in the sight of people. Not that we would look for uh, deification or glorification or man's accolades, but that we can use the elevation that you give us to bring more attention to the glory of God that is operating and resonating from our lives. So we thank you, Father, for this. We praise you, and we give you the glory and honor, once again, as well as the praise for all the things you're doing in our lives. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we did say, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Amen. As they said, your arms are, are too short to box with God. <laughs> you know, there's times where you don't understand why and what God is doing. But if you humble yourself, he'll make it clear in the future. I shared in a testimony yesterday that I was coming off of the surgical bed and still dealing with fevers and um, had a catheter. And, you know, God tells me you're not going back to the ministry where you were seen and, and, and visible and, you know, being used of God to touch many lives. You're going to go off and start your own church. And, and it's like, I could have said, no, I got the titles. I got the position and, the, you know, the popularity. I'm going back there. But no, I humble myself under God and say, it's not my will, but it's yours will, your will, you know, despite how things may seem to be. And matter of fact, God told me to go out and not only start a church, but you know, have me start calling places. I'm like, I'm not even out the bed yet. I can't, you know, I can only go up and down the stairs, even in a split level house, one day, one time a day. I'm not to the point where I'm walking through the neighborhood and praying. I'm just, you know, starting to get to the point where, okay, maybe I can go to the, the end of the street on a short street, a dead end, walk to the corner and back. That's my exercise for the day. Um, so it did not make sense, God's timing. And, you know, I remember when he first, spoke that into my spirit. I literally think I had the physical reaction as I was in bed, think coming off a fever back and forth. God said, you're not going back to, you know, to the church. You're starting a church. I literally think my reaction was, are you serious? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I shared my testimony recently. I said, it was almost like Alan Iverson when they asked him about practice. He said, practice? We talking practice? Practice. Come on. Practice? Seriously, we're talking practice? I think my reaction to God was like, start a church? Seriously? Start a church. You really mean to start, start a church? I can't take care of me in the, in the moment. I'm going to start a church. But if we humble ourselves under God, amen, 
not only in the trial and tribulation situations, but in the personal situations that may not make sense. Realizing that you're under, you're not just humbling yourself to a person. You're not just humbling yourself to some flippant whim or random thought that somebody has. No, you're humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God, the creator of the universe. Amen. So if you're going to humble yourself, there ain't no better place to put yourself under, amen, than the mighty hand of God that can move mountains, that can create planets, that can stop time. If you're going to humble yourself, man, that's the place to go. Because how many times have we humbled ourselves under people and got abused and misused and misunderstood and talked about and betrayed and kicked to the curb and some people may have kicked you to the curb and brought you back for another round. Humble yourself to them brought you nothing. But thank God when you humble yourself to him, man, he'll bless you in the current situation in years to come. You won't even be able to count the myriad of ways in which God will bless you. But you got to humble yourself under his mighty hand. And see, if we're looking for self-power and self-fame and wealth and abundance and the accolades of man, you may not humble yourself properly because you're trying to do your own thing to exalt yourself. Amen. God will show you, amen, that, you know, if you really trust him, it's a matter of trust. See, if, if you trust God, you can humble yourself and you don't care when the time of exaltation will come. You're focused on pleasing him, not, once again, having people see you a certain way or appreciate you. You know, and here's the thing. You know, you can have mankind exalt you, amen, according to your time or their timing. But some of those same people that lifted you up will be the same ones that cast you down. Amen. The very same ones. We see that in the Bible. Oh, praise God. Throwing out clothing. Palm fronds, layering the street for Jesus Christ. A few days later, crucify him. So you don't think it will, if it happened to our Lord Jesus Christ, you think it won't happen to you? Oh, that boss, that family member, that friend, laying out the palm fronds. Oh, here comes my buddy. Oh, you're such a good buddy. Oh, I love you. I admire you. You are the best. Week later, oh, a two Brutus casting you down, or sometimes you don't even see it, but they're secretly sitting back as you go through your trials and tribulations and downfalls. Amen. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He, not people, not yourself, will exalt you in due time. And as we see here, casting all I care upon him, for he cared for you. And the Lord brought back to my remembrance, um, Bishop Mears. Uh, I think it was Upper Marlboro Church. I got it right. I might have the church wrong, but Bishop Mears. I remember he shared his testimony. He was the son of the pastor of a, a church that was pretty vibrant. You know, hundreds of members and, you know, uh, his father preached for years and he, brought, he was brought up in the church and, um, he had gone to the point where the Lord started to pull on him that I've called you to ministry. And he's growing in faith. He's ready to answer to the, to the call of God. And he's communicating to his father, yet his father is giving him all the menial tasks in the church. <laughs> Which is very humbling. So he's doing work around the church, menial, uh, the labor, doing all the menial tasks around the church. And one day he's either sweeping something up or mopping something. And he overhears a conversation where people are mocking him and says that he has the janitorial ministry or call in his life. But yet he doesn't angry, angrily lash out. It just shows him that. Some of the people might be smiling in your face at the very ones who are mocking you and mocking what they see as your so-called call of God on your life. But he remained humble. And that shows you sometimes you may humble yourself 
and you're humbling yourself unto God. And even though you're being humble towards him and being humble to those who are leaders above you, you might have people that, like I said, smile on your face and they, you know, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, that song, The Backstabbers? <laughs> you might be living out that song. That song, smiling in your face. <laughs> oh, all they will do is take your place. The Backstabbers. <laughs> backstabbers. They're out there. But he humbled himself. He didn't argue with anybody. And it grieved his spirit to know how people were talking about him and straight out mocking him. But he stayed in his place. And when the time and the season came, you know, his father is retiring. Guess who gets elevated up? Amen. To become a man who not only oversees his church, but writes books and goes to other churches to mentor pastors. If he had not humbled himself under the mighty hand of God, he never would have been exalted up to that place. Amen. And that shows you too, casting all your care upon him. There's times where you'll be wounded, hurt, misunderstood. There's times where your situations won't turn around or come about the way that you desire for them to be, but you cast your care upon him knowing that he cares for you and he's going to handle your circumstances once again in the proper time and season. Amen. And if he had not gone through the humbling process, who knows what kind of pastor or bishop he would have eventually been. You know, some of the very things that might hurt you the most are the things that squeeze certain things out of you. Get rid of the leaven and the lumps, and they help mold and refine and strengthen you to be the person who you eventually become. So you may say, why was that necessary? But these are the sort of things that, you know, get you through and groom you, give you a greater revelation of God. You know, one of the things I shared is the same time that I was going through that bed of surgical affliction and dealing with the fevers that God says called you to, you know, start a church. You know, also going through a, a financial crisis. It seemed like there's a perfect storm of all these things coming in that I had to bear in turn, in, in addition to having, you know, physical things that I was going through. And you might say, it's unfair. Why would you have to go through all these things simultaneously? But whatever the call of God is, whatever God has planned for you, those are the things that you just got to trust in him. Once again, humble yourself. You don't have to understand it. It might hurt. <laughs> Sometimes you can't progress and grow unless you've gone through some type of pain and hurt and getting knocked around. But boy, the finished product, when you come out of that buffering, you know, that being banged around and you know, knock down and you keep calling and scratching and you raise and you come back up as you're trusting in God. Boy, does it refine and shape you for the future. Amen. Praise the Lord. So God does that. But once again, we got to be able to humble ourselves and we have to attribute all of our gifting, all of our wisdom, all these various ways in which in that due season when God elevates us, that we continue to attribute all those things to him. We're not, once again, looking for self-elevation or gratification. No, we need to remain humble so that God, not people, can provide the elevation. Even if God places it on the heart of the person that places you there. Amen. When you get to the place that God has elevated you, you owe all loyalties and all praise to God, not the man. And they can sit there and say, well, no, I'm not going to put you in that position. Well, you did it indirectly based upon the leadership and the guiding and the circumstances that came into play that God enabled. So, you know, yes, I will appreciate you maybe for giving me that elevation, for being the one that God used to do that. But all glory and honor and devotion still goes to God. He's the one at the end of the day that put everything into place that led to the elevation that you think you gave me, but you did it indirectly because it was God's elevation, not man's. And if God has given it to you, no man can steal it. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Praise the Lord. So, and that's one thing we got to continue to walk in. Amen. I talked about being a father to the fatherless and being approachable last week. If we're walking around, you know, pompous, I'm so wonderful and arrogant, you're not approachable to people. But even as I shared, um, you know, one of the, the, the young men that I talked to um, last week that immediately clicked with me, you know, we're just engaged in conversation. And, you know, I just said a couple things to basically talk at the level that he would interact. And the next thing you know, he's opening up. I'd only, met, only talked to him and had met him five to ten minutes earlier. And this young man starts giving me his background and the pain he's going through. You know, we're in a generation where a lot of teenagers are like, got nothing to say. I might shoot you a three-word text. And this young man opens up, it's just, bam, he's giving me all the stuff. I'm just like, wow. Humble yourself. Make yourself approachable. Having a heart to pray and look to impact lives. That's one of the greatest things as ambassadors of Christ that we could do to touch this fallen world. So that was my first point, amen, that, you know, we need to have that mindset and we need to walk in humility. Uh, I guess the main thing is that we use not only our natural gifts and talents, but also the spiritual one God, ones that God has lent us and have a willingness to use those gifts whenever God presents the opportunity not when we feel like, okay, I'm ready to go be used. No, you need to be on, on call, on, on alert, 24-7, that God can use you when it's his timing to do it. Um, next thing I want to look at is that we should have a strengthened resolve to retain God's standards. And this, that's despite ungodly influences. A strengthened resolve to retain God's standards despite ungodly influences. So we've seen in the life of Daniel that they were essentially kidnapped. Um, and they weren't kidnapped because they were just any old children. They had two major attributes related to them. They were part of the royal family and they were also seen to be or perceived to be intelligent. So they want to snatch them up, bring them in, groom them to think like the very oppressor who had basically ruined their lives. So in order to augment that the honor that people would afford the idols of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, as we call them, were brought in and groomed just for a period of three years. But one of the things you also see is that they had previous names. But now Nebuchadnezzar decided to assign new names to them. And one of the things like a lot of people don't know is that those names that they were, were attributed to them, taking them from their, their, their birth names over to these new names, those new names were associated with idolatry. And because he saw Daniel as being the most gifted of the four, he gave him a name designation that was associated with the name of their most prestigious idol or God, Belshazzar. So imagine you're serving God. <laughs> it's almost like that scene in Roots where Kunta Kinte, they want to call him Toby. No, my name is Kuta Kinte. No, your name is Toby. No, it's Kuta. Toby, you know, going back and forth and like, we'll, we'll beat you, we'll punish you. You got to beat me and punish me then. My name is not Toby. My name is the name I was given at birth. Um, and we see here that they started attributing those names to him. The name Daniel, his original name, his birth name, uh, means God is my judge. And Nebuchadnezzar said, I change your name to Belteshazzar. Once again, closely attributed to their most prestigious idol, Belshazzar. They start calling Daniel Belteshazzar. It means Bel, Bel's prince or 
and sets Baal's prince. It's also a composite Hebrew name that starts with Din, D-I-N, <laughs> uh, which means severity and restraint, and combined with L E L or kindness. And it's basically denoting a transformation from se severity that he encountered over to kindness. He went through a lot of severe stuff, but yet in the midst of all this, he remained humble and kind, and he was able to be used by God. The other friend, Hananiah was the original name, which means beloved by the Lord. But it was changed to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun god. Oh, he was illuminated by a sun. <laughs> In that fiery furnace, he was illuminated, but it was the son of man. <laughs> going into that fire furnace to save those young men. So yeah, there was illumination. I thought we threw in four pe three people. There's a fourth in there. <laughs> the Lord coming before the time of his fleshly birth, amen. Times he appeared, big A, angel of the Lord, that comes in to interact. So there was an illumination, but it was not by some false God, a false son God. Amen. But he was spared by illumination. Amen. Of the Lord himself visiting them in that furnace. The next boy was Mishael, meaning who is as God, who is as God. It was changed to Meshach which some people believe means who is like Shaq, not Shaquille O'Neal, S-H-A-Q, S-H-A-C-H, or Shaq or Shaq. But it's not a basketball player. <laughs> um, which some believe was a Babylonian goddess corresponding to Ishtar or Venus, which we know Venus is kind of like the love goddess. So they're saying, who is like Shock or Shad? But he remained like the Lord his God. And the last one was Azariah, meaning the Lord is my help. His name was changed to Abednego, or servant of Nago. And they tried to get him to bow down to Nago or Nebuchadnezzar. He's like, not going to happen. Because I'm recalling the origin of my name. That the Lord is my help, not man. And even if you throw me in a fiery furnace to execute me, you, I mean, execute me, the Lord is still my help. And he was helped mightily. Amen. So thank God that each one of them in, in the situation that they directly could face compromise. If you bow down. Or if you stop praying, you know, and if you give glory to Nebuchadnezzar, we won't kill you. And each one of those four, you know, people say we will bow down to nobody but the God who our parents is still in us. You can kidnap us from our place of origin. You can try to groom us and embed us with the philosophies of this new culture, language and religion. But you're not taking away from us the essential aspects of who we are. We will not compromise what was instilled in us, which was our love and devotion to God. And the more that they try to transform them or program them, they still return, retain their resolve that we will only worship one God and we will bow down to no man. We only bow down to God. So as God has made us ambassadors out here 
interacting with and sometimes serving a fallen world. We could be out there in this world. The world can even attribute certain characteristics or names to us where your people are like this or you know what I mean? They try to throw things on us and box us in, stigmatize or mischaracterize us. Sometimes they try to use various stereotypes to view us or name us or put us in a certain box. But as we're ambassadors of Christ, we don't bow down to any other God, nor do we give glory to any man. We stay faithful, and instead of being weakened by what the world system tries to do to us, in the same manner, we need to have a strengthened or renewed resolve that I will not yield, I will not bend. I'm only going to stay true to the God that created all things and his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. They are the only ones I'm going to give glory to, and they're the only ones who I'm going to live according to. Amen? Not to any man. So they may have thought that attributing names associated with their gods to them would be part of the process of, of programming them to be like us and thinking like us to no longer see us as the, the oppressors, but to say, you're one with us. But all this did was galvanize them further to be strengthened, like I said, in their resolve to abstain from the royal delicacies, the traditions, the religion, and other things that were available for our consumption, use, or transition to into no we might be forced to be in this kingdom we'll even serve in our roles and serve the king politely and respectfully but no you're not going to program us to be something other than what we are so we will respect you as much as is permitted but no you're not going to rewire us you're not going to change how we view life or our god and we'll do it to the best of our ability, but there are limitations on what you could get us to do. And that's why when they were faced with situations where you're gonna bend the knee and do this or else, all four of them said, we'll take the or, the or else, Alex. <laughs> Answer to this question is, I'll take, what is refusing to bend my knee to your false god, Alex, for $100. I'll take that. Oh, you gonna throw me in the furnace? Throw away, because <laughs> I'm not bending my knee. <laughs> you wanna throw me in a den of lions? Well, I guess that's where I'm going, because I'm not gonna bend my knee to your god. See, there's a difference between respectful servitude to an oppressor or somebody who is ungodly and elite in leadership above you. There's a difference between that and just doing whatever they say. And sometimes you see those types of compromises, you know, where people just totally abandon or compromise their faith to be in alignment with everybody else. You know, we're really seeing that, you know, this week, unfortunately, you know, people professing Christians and some of this stuff, now, there's, there's having compassion, there's praying for people, there's, there's, there's you know, approaching people and trying to, you know, help them and stuff like that. But some of these people, some of the stuff y'all posting ain't got nothing to do with the Christian faith and the God we serve. That's right. Amen? That's right. So, and I'm going to leave it at that. But some of these people, professing Christians, do not know the word. And it's something that happens all the time. You know, I had a situation last night, you know, I'm not going to say the person, but we're talking about <laughs> overcoming cancer. And one of the people that spoke said that, you know, she felt shame. Because it would be like, well, man, I thought you were serving God faithfully. How did you get cancer? Hmm. What secret sin do you have? And she, she had to pray about that, like, you know, people judge me and stuff like that. And I'm just like, that's totally unbiblical. Stupid. <laughs> John chapter 9. <laughs> For what reason 
is was this man was it his the man or his parents that sinned that he was born blind? First of all, that statement right that question right there is illogical. Who sinned, the man or his parents that he was born blind? Well, why are you talking to the man about what his sin? He was a baby when he was born blind, right? So who sinned, the man or he wasn't a man yet? He was a baby coming through. So he sinned coming out of the birth canal, like, like, and it was attributed to an adult sin. Like the logic in the question, <laughs> judgmental, is totally errant. And Jesus said, no, he's born blind. What? That God, amen, would be glorified through me coming along in my ministry to end the, the physical ailment that he had. Amen. Sometimes we like trying to sit here and figure out why this happened, why that happened, what you don't have an earthly logical reason. Is that God be manifested in that situation? That's the reason. And we go around trying to figure things out, scrutinize and stuff like that. We need to stay in our lane and let God be God. That's right. Some people might have looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. <laughs> what are they doing up there in the palace? Serving the very man that murdered their families. They're doing the will of God. <laughs> same as Joseph same as Moses God is the one who positioned the situation amen that he be used later on it's not up to us to understand why the person who should hate the guy he's serving is in the position where he's elevated to a governor and now speaking into the guy's life God knows the times and seasons and the reasons and we need to stay out of that. But the good thing we see about that is that they went through three years of training. If they had failed that training, they would have killed them. You didn't meet our expectations, dead. But they passed all that. And they were elevated up to the role of being wise men. And, and then you get to the place where, you know, let's see if we can totally make them fit in. Give them Babylonian names and, you know, give them the delicacies. You know, send them over food and wine and, you know. Have them start to get comfortable with that, and then we can start to introduce them to other things. You know, they can learn how to party like we party. And you know some of the depraved things that those people did. And, and then finally, let's get them to the point where it couldn't help hurt you to come with me later today. I'm going to give a sacrifice to, you know, Bell, the sun god. Or, or, or Venus, or our, our, our version of Venus, Shaq. It can't hurt for you to come with me to, to worship them. Matter of fact, it would benefit your life if you went and gave an altering over to that idol. And the three Hebrew boys and Daniel said, no, we will not bow down to them. We will not worship to them. And even in Daniel's case, when they were mad at him, he was still praying multiple times a day to God, and they tried to make him stop. No, I will not stop praying to my God, which is according to my religion. I'm not going to stop doing the things I need to do to stay in good relationship to the God that I humble myself to. And they wanted to kill him. He said, you have to do what you got to do. I'm not going to stop. And you could break my body. You could throw me in the den of lions, but you can't stop my spirit from crying out to God and my heart, my mind and everything that's, that's within me from continuing to glorify him no matter what happens to me physically. You can take my life, but you can't take my spirit and my devotion to God. Praise the Lord. So they tried to get them as part of that process, giving them new names and then trying to give them non-kosher, we'll call it kosher today, um, delicacies, but they refused that. And they said, no, you know, and they said, hey, we give him respectfully. You know, they, they weren't all angry. I won't do this, you know, rabble rousers. No, they said, look, let's put this to the test. Can we just eat what's acceptable to our, our beliefs and our culture? Just give us 10 days. And if we look malnourished, we will yield. We will eat everything that you bring to us without complaint. And in the test, they were more radiant than anybody else that was eating all that stuff. <clears throat> so they still remained respectful, but they adhered 
to what their faith and their culture told them to do. And because they refused to yield, God blessed them to look more radiant. Let's go to another passage, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so what do we yield ourselves to? Who are we keeping in mind as we're presenting ourselves, as we go out there interacting with a world that may not have the same standards that God has called us to? It says that we are presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. Amen? So we're expected to conduct and carry ourselves a certain way. The world system may not do it, and sometimes it might be a harder road, but we're not, most of us, especially here in, in the United States, we're not sacrificing ourselves unto death as people are doing overseas. For example, I got contacted this week by, uh, I was surprised, I was on a call, and all of a sudden, um, I just got a call via Skype on my computer. I was like, hmm, huh, that's weird. But I was doing an interview, so I was like, I can't pick it up. <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry, I was on a call. Um, somebody I'm mentoring. So I was like, man, I can't pick it up. Um, then it went about five minutes, and it rang again. I was like, you know what, I better take this in case this is an emergency. So I said, can you excuse me? I'll call you right back. And he said, yes. I clicked yes, bam. And it's people from this church in Pakistan. I had been contacted probably three or four years ago by a, um, a woman pastor over there that was asking for materials um, and was trying to see if I could either come there or could live, you know, simulcast over there. And we were still in the midst of discussing it and all of a sudden, bam, no responses. And, and periodically, I used to wonder, like, you know, are they okay? Uh, what's going on over there? And so when it rang, I was like, that's kind of odd, you know? And, and you, you know, you're trying to make a call without at least maybe sending a chat message first. Hey, can we connect from the call? So then it came in again. I was like, you know, let me catch this. I go, bam, pick it up. And there's somebody on there on video. <laughs> and it was funny at first because he's like, Oh, you can't turn on your video? And I was like, uh, I said, you kind of called me unexpectedly. So can you give me a second to get my, myself positioned and ready? So we talked for a while um, and just went through that, that process. And they're still trying to now, I guess, again, um, trying to set things up where I can either come there or do some type of live or, or video um, to start, you know, producing content for them or maybe even do a live service with them. So, um, you know, these sort of things, you know, as we seek to make ourselves a living sacrifice, you know, sometimes you have local opportunities to bless people, but in this day and age with the internet, you just don't know. You could be reaching people on the other side of the planet that are still part of an oppressed church. And um, they said they're blessed. Um, they didn't, during our conversation, um, express that there was anything wrong going on. They did ask for support, but they didn't say anything like we're in danger or anything like that. But, you know, that could still be something that they're dealing with, that we have so much ease here to make ourselves available to touch lives for Christ. And as the word say, says, are we um, redeeming the time, you know, seizing our word with salt? looking for opportunities to be a blessing to other people. You know, I really try to have a mindset when I go out every day, you know, is there an opportunity um, to engage somebody in conversation? And I may not necessarily say chapter and verse, but 
uh, you know, present principles to them to say, hey, you know, I care about you as a person. You know, are you okay? Is there anything I could do to help you? And you can't necessarily help every situation, but we can have a heart that we're going to try to have an impact as we're out there on a daily basis because you just never know when this situation was, will occur. You know, I prayed to be a father to a fatherless. I've been praying this for years. It's something that's a continual thing that Pam and I, you know, fast and pray about. And, you know, specifically touching upon that last week, you know, when I talked to these two young men, both 15 years old and maybe fathers, I was working out. So you just never know when the situation will occur. Um, but you, if you're ready, you can possibly be in position. Amen. Um, so we got to have that type of mindset to always be living sac sacrifices. And as we see here, be wholly acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. You're not doing God a favor because you made yourself a, a, a available at a time that might be inconvenient for you. No, it's a reasonable service. You know, God of heaven has guaranteed you eternal life. Who knows what situations or hardship and emotional pain we may have endured at the time that we got saved, as well as the number of things that he's done for us since that time. So it's our reasonable service. And it's not like we signed up for this gig and God says, you know, well, if I give you eternal life, well, you got to sign this contract and you got to, you owe me certain things here now. No, it's because of our devotion and our relationship and because of the things he's done in us. You know, we want to share the things that he's done for us in the lives of others so that the same way he transformed us, he healed us, he elevated us, he delivered us, he strengthened us. He, he did so many different things to transform our lives, amen, and give us a new outlook that maybe we didn't have for salvation. If you really love him and appreciate the things that he's given you, how can you not but help? other people and try to introduce that to them. Amen? So, we're in this world, we might be surrounded by oppressors, but once again, we need to be strengthened that I will not yield to the world system's nonsense. No, I will not uh, allow my mind to be transformed because I'm in the midst of a culture to the thinking of that culture. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were snatched up in a traumatic fashion and brought into a culture. And then they had the religion and the cultures and the philosophies of the oppressor drilled into their heads for three years of tedious and rigid training. And yet they said, I'll learn your language. I'll learn your culture so that we can interact with other you know, nations but you're still not going to take out the essence of what God has put in me. Amen. Too many people are being transformed by the renewing of their mind, but is it transformed by the renewing of your mind to come into alignment with God's word and God's thinking? As I said, I've seen a lot of stuff this week that has shown me that people have been transformed in their minds. Well, I think instead of it being in alignment with God's word, they need to be deprogrammed from some of this stuff that they've accepted. And they don't have to say it, but they are advertising it. And that's not the only situation. There's other times where I've seen stuff. I'm just like, whoa, um, people have been transformed. Well, actually, maybe not even transformed. You never came into the fullness of God's ways of thinking to be in the place of saying some of these carnal things that they're espousing now. So God wants us not to conform or to be patterned after, shaped, molded after, thinking like the culture of this world system. And one of the biggest problems that we see, especially in the United States, is that we have these weak-minded, untrained, poorly equipped, world-shaped Christians with quotes. <laughs> I saw somebody post yesterday. Um, I thought it was amusing. You know, they start saying rhino over the last couple of years. You know, Republicans in name only. 
So without the H, R-I-N-O. Republicans in name only. I saw somebody post yesterday, we got a lot of, I don't know if you call it Sinos or Chinos, C-I-N-O. Christians in name only. I was like, ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> I had to remember that one. <laughs> you can't judge me. Oh, I'm not. I'm just observing. You judge yourself by what you're saying. <laughs> but you have not been renewed in your mind. You have not conformed to God, but you've conformed to this world system. You have not been transformed by the renewing of your mind to think and act and conduct yourself like God, but you've been transformed or never were transformed away from the thinking of this world system, and your mind is laced with worldly philosophies. And like I said, uh, I don't have to go chapter and verse. Just the very thing you're sharing is advertising that you're in alignment with this world system. And once again, that doesn't take away from having compassion for people. Amen? You still love them. You still have compassion. You pray for them. You try your best to be there for them. But, you know, similar to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, uh, it's not like I want to go around disagreeing with people and be in a place where they think I'm hard-hearted or you don't understand or you're unfeeling. And, and I try not to come off that way, but, you know, if the cost of me coming to alignment with your philosophies and joining in with that means, you know, uh, that I have to be somebody that you reject or you think I'm hard-hearted or stubborn or whatever, then let me be hard-hearted, stubborn, or whatever, because I'm not going to align myself up. I'm not going to bow down the same way, you know, they did not bow down to the God of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not bowing down to the God of this world system. I'm not going to do it. So if I got to go in the lion's den, if I got to get, get thrown in a fiery furnace, then so be it. But I'm not going to bow down to what this world system is trying to get me to do and to think. We see here it says that we have to be, we do not conform to this world. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind that we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What are we proving in our daily life? Amen. That's the question. What are you proving? And that word prove, I think I shared it last week or a week before, is basically saying that in your conduct, in your actions, in your speech, your body language, whatever criteria, you are showing evidence of your transformation and belief in God or whatever thing you're in alignment with. And Jesus made it plain. You know, you're on one side or the other. The Word of God talks about the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You know, there's times where we can meet people where they're at, but we don't come across and take on the philosophies of this world system to be comfortable or to make people comfortable. No, we need to prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect by standing firm on the Word of God, yet with love and with being approachable. Those things can both be true. And I think sometimes people think, uh, well, I got to be extreme in this or I got to do this. No, you can walk in love, by, but, but still say, hey, I'm sorry, but I can't support that. I can't join in on that. No, I won't. I won't help you fund that. You know, I remember, you know, years ago, helping people in um, situations where people would just use stuff and continue on on the same path. And I had a situation, um, somebody would, would, would come to the church and not to give any names or anything, but come to church when they had a need. So I had helped the family several times, including keeping them from get, being evicted. And um, another time something came up and I made an observation, you know, to myself, not out loud. I was just like, you approach me and you ask for financial assistance to get your car repaired. But then you call me before it's done to say, um, I'm stuck here at this place. Um, do you think you could come pick me up and give me and my daughters a ride home? So I do that, and the very place where I'm picking you up is they're all getting hair braided. Probably $60, $80 a pop. 
but you need money to get your car fixed. And your wife don't work. Your wife can braid some hair for free, and your money can go to. <laughs> so I still gave the help. I was like, um, there's already been a, several times I've helped you out. So, you know, I'm not requiring you to do this, but I recommend, since <laughs> I've dealt with situations that I can help you come and formulate a plan to budget. And I can still provide some assistance along the way. So let's sit down, let's make a game plan. Let's put it all out here on the table. Didn't want that. So one time didn't, you know, would help, would hear from people in a while, come back, crisis, help, boom. Come back again, crisis, one time. I get the call and I said, let me pray about this. I'm praying and this situation facing eviction again. And I'm praying and saying, God, what should I do? And he said, tell him no. Because they don't want me. Mm -hmm. They don't want you. All they want is that. Now I'm walking totally being, being as a guy. I ain't got an attitude. I'm not trying to be harsh hearted. Mm -hmm. I picked that phone up. So I prayed and the Lord said, you know, and I repeated what the Lord said. Mm -hmm. And you know, usually if you thought somebody's trying to take advantage and you said to them, like, man, you don't really, seems like you just care about what I can do for you, not for what I can do. The person's immediate, immediate reaction is, no, 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 I don't feel that way. I said it to a person. Silence. Couldn't even lie to, <laughs> which I would have known is a lie. You don't care about me. Mm -hmm. But most people would at least lie. No, no. I wouldn't, I, no, I don't feel that way about you. The person couldn't even lie. I was like, well, at least he's honest. <laughs> and the funny thing is that wasn't the first time I made such a statement and every time the person was basically like you don't care about me you just care about what you get from me wow I guess there's a blessing in being honest <laughs> so the world will say like well, wait a minute you're a man of God and that's what we say about you church folk, especially you preachers. You just say, take money, <clears throat> live off it, and you don't do anything to help the community. And here we see a perfect example of, I was led by the Spirit of God. The times I was supposed to give, I gave. The time God told me, no, can't help you. I prove and I align myself and did not conform to this world. And as they say, I will give you the, the, the shirt off my back. But the Lord tells me don't help you. Guess what? I ain't going to help you. There's times I've helped people, but I haven't helped them the way they want. Oh, can you know, give me an extra pound weight? No, I can take the grocery store down. Because the Lord showed me you a drug addict. I don't fund drugs. I'll put some food in your belly. But I ain't funding your habit. And if you mad because I don't give you money, well, be mad. I'm conforming to God, not the spirit and philosophies and mindsets of this world. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you one last one for today from Le Leviticus 18. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So we see here the commandment that God gave Moses and told him to speak that over to the children of Israel so that they could never come back and say, well, oh, we sinned because we weren't aware. No, no, no. God told Moses to tell you specifically that you need to abide in what I tell you to do, my commandments. And then he also goes further and says, hey, you know, you dwelt in the land of Egypt, and then you had all these different things in the land of Canaan. But, you know, 
Even though you've gone through these different situations, I don't want you polluted with their religion, their cultures, and their practices. So although you've come through these things, you are not going to abide by them. You will not get ingrained with those philosophies. You will continue to walk in my ordinances, not the ordinance of them. Amen? And then he even says it. I am the Lord your God. You know, think about that one. You know, why do you have to say that? He's just emphasizing to them, like, they ain't your God. I'm your God. And there's going to be a time where you're going to be dealing with compromise. Like, you could do the things that you learned in Egypt. You could do the things that you learned in Canaan. There might be situations where compromise faces you and you feel a temptation. Like, well, I can make my road easier or I can get connections or fame, power, wealth, whatever it is, by compromising and just going along. Well, I don't really worship it, but uh, it couldn't hurt to, like, go along and don't rattle the cage and shake the tree and I just get along, you know. Well, you know, I won't even say, like, I worship your God, but, you know, I just kind of, like, turn the blind eye a little bit when I see that going on because it will make the road easier for me because God said he's going to bless me, but and here's an opportunity, so just won't shake anything up. I won't rattle any cages. I don't really believe in that, but it can't hurt a little bit just to go in there and be quiet when they get to that part because it's going to open the door for God's blessing. And God's like, no, do not compromise. Do not do their practices. You know, who is your God? Those people that you see as an opportunity to bring blessings to you or me, the one true God. So that's why he's emphasizing that there. You know, that, that colon is a pause. But it's a pause after he, first he says, you will not do their ordinances. And then in, in verse 4, he says, you shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances. And that's what you'll walk in. Pause. Why? Because I am the Lord your God, not them. That's what he's basically saying. They ain't your God. And yeah, you might make the road a little easier. You might make yourself a little more acceptable. Some of the hatred or animosity that they might have for you could be alleviated if you just lighten up a little bit and stop being so hardcore Christian or, you know, just 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 tone, tone it down a little bit. Put away your Christian card. Or, you know, you don't have to every time a, a situation that comes up that will compromise your faith, you know, either say I can't do that or I won't do that or I can't be involved. Can't you just lighten up and once in a while just, just go along for the ride? That's what the word will tell you. But God says, no, when you do that, you're basically saying that you're elevating them up and making their ordinances, their practices and belief greater than mine. So the question at the end of the day is, who is your God? And he says here, if you keep my statutes and my judgments, you will live in them. And then he's making a, doing the pause again. You will live in them. And when you live in them, what are you living in? The blessings and the promises. And then there's a colon once again. There's a pause. Why will you live in them? Because I am the Lord your God. I'm guaranteeing you that I'm going to make these things come into fruition. So there's a pause. I am the Lord your God. When he's telling you what you should not do and, 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 and compromise yourself in. And then there's another pause and an emphasis of I am the Lord when you can gain the promises of God. Praise the Lord. Because the world will have you compromise. You know, I shared yesterday in my testimony. That time we went through hardship to the point almost of losing the house. You know, I had one situation where um, after struggling uh, making budget plans with different organizations to pay the lights, things like that. I'm just like, okay, a few dollars here, throw that there, but not full payment because I need some over here. You know, I've been there. Amen. And I had a situation where I got um, approved for a job. So I was like, yes, blessing is finally here. After all this struggling, sometimes calling the mortgage company because my paperwork for a loan modification got lost multiple times. So sometimes instead of me spending about eight hours a day trying to job hunt, I was spending four to six, sometimes eight hours on the phone 
just trying to get through getting that process done. You know, only to find out after it was, well, that was just a nightmare. So I was going on and on and, and, and pursuing that. And, you know, a job, I finally got a job offer. It was paying a nice rate. So I was like, yes, thank you, Jesus. I can start, you know, and they're even sending me equipment. I go out and buy a desk for all my new equipment they're sending me. So I'm about ready to go. And I'm like, yes, yes, finally got the victory over this. God has turned things around. <laughs> Computers and everything are shipped. I got a UPS tracking thing. <laughs> the day the stuff was going to be delivered, early that morning, I get the call for the company. They had to rescind the job offer. You know the thing that my victory mm -hmm. and saving my house and all that stuff mm -hmm. after I'm coming off of cancer? You know, that victory. <laughs> I got a call from them. We have to rescind the job offer. Not because you did anything wrong. Not because we, we did a criminal background check and something came out horrible. But because during the time I was going through the financial hardship, the project was tied into the banking industry. Mm -hmm. So like, we looked at your credit as beneath what we could accept. So you literally pulled my job opportunity over my credit store score. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing, I don't cry. <laughs> That's all I have to cry. I can count the number of times I cry. My mom died, I cried. My best friend, that took about three days. I think I finally cried. Um, 34 and a half years, I don't think Pam's even seen me cry. Mm -hmm. You ever been hurt so bad that you can't even cry? I mean, this is beyond David. David wept himself sore at the battle, after the battle of Ziklag. They called me up. UPS comes up with my equipment. I had to refuse it and say, take it back. Take it. I mean, they literally drove up. I go outside, send it back. I walk back in the house. Pam looks at me. I'm just like, I, I can't even talk. I think, I, I think that was my longest walk, <laughs> post-surgical. I just, I had to walk it off. I was like, hurt so bad, I can't even cry and produce tears because I'm about to lose my, my home. I felt my wife, I felt my kids. That, do what you want to me. But when it impacts them that powerfully, that was such a crushing pain that you know, I had to walk that off. And I remember I walked over to Lake, Lake Villa, went over there, and I prayed, and I was like, okay, that's enough time in my pity pot, time to go back to war. And I went home, was like, going after it. And I had opportunities. Here's the thing, and this is my point. I had opportunities after that that I could do certain things. But certain of the projects I could have picked up that would have paid as much as the one that got rescinded. Now notice, God allowed that. Mm -hmm. God let me apply. Mm -hmm. God let me go through multiple interviews. God let me get a job offer and a contract I signed with equipment coming on the way. God allowed that. So let's not blame the world. God allowed that. Mm -hmm. And God allowed that pain that I couldn't cry her so much. God allowed that. And I already gone through physical pain I had bladder spasms after the surgery. I'm coming off trying to get my body strong. Then I get an emotional wound on top of that. And the whole time God's like, trust me in this, trust me in this, you know? And then in comes the oppressor's compromise. You do this project, hey, some of these projects, you can make more money than the one that just spit in your face and took the equipment back, you know? Say, so, nope, I will not do that. I will not compromise my faith, even to get money that will save our family. I will not compromise my faith and get on a project that I know right off the gate is sinful. I will not do that project. Next thing you know, I had talked to somebody um, months ago. Like once I um, separate from my former um, partner who's a drug addict and alcoholic, once I sever that corporation by paying them off of the settlement, I'm gonna have you do a new website for me. And this thing had been holding around for months. All of a sudden, I'm in bed. This guy calls me. And it's just like, hey, man, ready to start the project. Ready to go? You know? And I didn't know. I was like, may it never happen. Can I? Are you ready to go? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? He said, what's your address? And I'm thinking, like, send a check in the mail. He said, oh, no, I'm bringing it to you. 
all of a sudden the Lord just starts bringing in money, mm -hmm. you know? So there's, there's going to be times, in other words, when we're faced with compromise, like Dan Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, in the midst of oppression or being surrounded by things that are contrary to God, we're always going to have opportunities that the enemy, not God, the enemy will send our way to enable us to compromise. Amen? But we got to be true to God's word. I will not walk in their ordinances. I will not walk in their ways. I'm going to stay true to God. And we stay true to God. God, as we see here, he's going to fulfill his promise. You will live in my statutes and judgments, the very thing you adhere to. If you keep them, you're going to live in them because I am the Lord your God. And I can tell you the shadow of fact, God turned it around, never had financial trouble, um, struggle since. Amen. And what if I had compromised? You just never know. Could have lost our house. Because you may think you're doing the devil's bidding. You know, there's just no telling. You know, I may have gone into a door that was sinful and God and we've been blocked off from all the other situations that God has given me over the years to be solid in that area. You know, so we have to stay true to God. I'm going to close with that and we'll continue on next week. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus. We give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything that you're doing in our lives. And we just thank you, Father, for making us victorious. We also thank you, Father, that in the midst of being surrounded by kingdoms or leadership or situations that may not be godly or we may have been brought into, even dramatically at some times, that we have a responsibility to stay true to our faith. Um, in the midst of these things, Lord, we can continue to walk in our natural gifts as well as our spiritual gifts, we can still receive revelation, even as Daniel did, to be effective, to touch lives, to impart wisdom, um, and be uh, impactful ambassadors in the lives of those that we interact with. And we just thank you, Father, that um, even though the world may try to attribute worldly things to us, in the midst of those things, we can still, um, in some situations, go along with the practices of of the surrounding leadership but where we need to draw a line and said i will not bend my knee i will not idolize i will not even involve myself with certain things let us be determined and have a great resolve that we will not compromise our faith and we do praise you father that um, as we do that um, you would continue to bless us we praise you that as we walk according to your statu statutes your ordinances and your judgments in terms of how we perceive things. Um, your word says that we will live in them, which means that we will prosper and be in good health, even as our souls prosper as we adhere to you. We praise you, Father, that you will continue to bless us. And we do pray, Father, that you will continue to anoint us. Um, once again, give us opportunities to touch people. And in all situations, let us be uh, approachable and compassionate, once again, yet without compromise and we do praise you father that we would not um, yield our minds or our spirits and our practices to the philosophies of this world system but instead we would be conformed to your likeness and we would be continually renewed um, in the spirit of our minds by your word that we would continue to walk as daniel shadrach meshach and, and abednego did ambassadors within a foreign kingdom that still had a great impact and while still retaining and staying strong in their faith. We pray that we would do the same as well. And we just give you the praise, the honor and glory, Father, for these things, and as well as give us a fruitful and a safe week ahead. We thank and praise you, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.